Well, good day, everyone. My name is Alan Zelnick, and I serve two functions within Atlas. First of all, I'm a senior consultant for weathering science within our global consulting group. And also, uh, secondarily, I'm a specialist in photovoltaics and solar energy materials. And today, we're going to be talking about uh, durability and reliability and how they intersect uh, weatherability and weatherability testing. Just a little bit of brief background, I have 38 years in analytical chemical methods of analysis, and for the past 18 years I've been involved as a weathering science specialist with Atlas. For those of you who are not familiar with Atlas as a company, just a very brief introduction. We are the world's largest and oldest company involved with the weatherability testing of materials and products. This includes operating large outdoor exposure sites for large-scale testing of materials and products, such as shown here. Uh, these are pictures of two of our primary uh, North American sites, one in South Florida and one outside of Phoenix, Arizona. In addition to these two major sites, uh, we also have a worldwide exposure network which provides approximately you know, 20 different locations around the world and most major continents. In addition to doing static fixed position testing, uh, exposing to the sun and weather, we also have developed a variety of accelerated testing techniques, such as the large Fresnel concentrated solar reflectors that we see here, which concentrates uh, 10 times sunlight onto test samples. We also pioneer the concept of accelerated laboratory artificial weathering with uh, devices based on uh, carbon arc and xenon arc lighting systems. Uh, and have expanded that over the years. In addition to manufacturing the instruments uh, for use in your own laboratory, we also operate these as commercial weathering testing locations in a number of locations around the world. So now let's talk about uh, weatherability and durability and reliability. This is one of my favorite quotes by Niels Bohr. You may remember his name from uh, your basic chemistry classes uh, where he uh, that came up with the concept of the, uh, the Bohr atomic model with all the various different electrons in their orbital shells. And one of his quotes is, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And yet that is precisely what we are oftentimes called upon uh, in product development and reliability analysis is we are trying to make projections about long-term performance of a product, uh, typically based on relatively short-term accelerated tests. Well, why do we really care about issues regarding uh, durability, reliability, weatherability? Well, here, for example, is an illustration of a typical bridge over a, a river here in the United States. From a distance, it looks quite good, but if we move up a little bit closer, we'll see that uh, clearly the bridge needs a new paint job. The, uh, the paint is peeling, and it's no longer you know, completely protecting the ironwork substrate so that the, uh, the iron is starting to, uh, to rust a little bit. But the, the lack of a, a nice quality paint system doesn't make the bridge unusable. It still carries traffic safely and reliably. However, if we examine this even a little bit more closely, on the underside of the bridge, we'll see that, oh, we do have some, some issues starting to surface. Uh, we have some of the crossbars and stabilizers. Uh, our gusset plates are being rusted through on the right-hand side. And in the photo on the left, we see some of the concrete is starting to fall from the rebar uh, corrosion. So clearly, this bridge has a durability problem. Eventually, this decline in the durability of these materials may reach a critical point where the bridge can no longer safely carry traffic. So there is technically a bit of a difference between uh, the concepts of durability and reliability that I'd just like to, to clarify a little bit. I don't want to belabor this point too much. Uh, however, <clears throat> the reliability of a system it's oftentimes a combination of a function of the durabilities of the individual materials or components or subsystems. If the materials or subsystems uh, decline in performance below some critical level, such as uh, mechanical integrity, as we saw with the rusted uh, you know, bridge beams, that can contribute to you know, certainly a loss of durability and eventually can contribute to a loss of reliability, a failure of the bridge system. So very often, but not always, but very often durability uh, of all the various materials contributes to overall reliability of the product. Or the other way it can be looked at that reliability is a function of the durability of the, well, many of the individual materials. 
So just like the picture on the left, the system reliability is only good as its weakest link. So we would derive our maximum benefit when we optimize both the overall reliability and the durability in a cost-effective manner. So when we're looking at the, the chain analogy, again, the individual materials in a manufactured product or components, each has its own particular sensitivities and environmental degradation uh, and mechanical stresses that, that act on it and may cause that to fail. So again, the system reliability is a function of the various individual components and the entire system is really typically only good as its weakest link. And that's an important concept because if we spend money on trying to improve otherwise durable and reliable components, well, we get no net increase in overall system reliability because it still fails from the res result of the weakest link. Uh, but it does cost a, a lot of money to over-design a product. Conversely, if we fail to identify where this weakest link is, we risk not being able to improve the product to an acceptable level. Uh, and potentially, this underdesign can not only risk warranty money, uh, but also potential you know, health and safety. Uh, another way that we can look at reliability, which in different industries sometimes has some different definitions, but in the broadest sense, it's the measure of unanticipated interruptions or unavailability of the product or system during its intended use. Okay. So as an example, here we have uh, someone happily talking on their mobile telephone. That mobile uh, phone works because it relays a signal through the cell phone tower shown on the left-hand side of the photograph. Uh, but here on the right-hand side of the photograph, we see that this cell, particular cell phone tower had an electrical problem and uh, caught fire. So clearly, uh, he's going to lose his signal and be a very frustrated telephone talker, as we see here in the center photograph. So technically, reliability analysis is a relatively formalized engineering discipline that applies various different mathematical techniques to the measurement and prediction of the reliability of components and systems. Now, that statement by itself, the fact that it uh, employs mathematical techniques, uh, principally statistical methods, uh, has several important implications that I'll talk about in just a moment. Durability, on the other hand, is the ability of a material or a component to resist wear, uh, decay, conditions of stress, typically over time. Some products are not particularly long lived, such as the the tire that we see here on the left, which maybe only you know may last uh, seventy five thousand kilometers before it needs to be replaced. On the other hand, we have other products such as you know the Egyptian pyramids, which have remained relatively durable over a period of uh, millennia. Now, it's important to understand that when we look at the loss of durability properties, they can be the result from several different methods of action, several different modes. Uh, for example, here we have some pictures of some ice cubes which are starting to melt because the ice cubes are above the zero degrees Celsius, uh, so they are starting to melt. And once they've melted, as long as I'm above the freezing point, that water will never turn back into ice cubes. So this is an example of a failure or a durability event caused by uh, a single stress relaxation type of event. When the stress is applied and the product then uh, relieves that stress, in this case by melting. Uh, on the other hand, many failures are not the result of a single event, but rather the accumulation of a repetitive number of cycles of the same event, typically cyclic fatigue. Uh, so, for example, the rubber band that we have here in the center photograph, if I stretch and relax, stretch and relax this repeatedly, eventually the strength of this rubber band is going to start to give out and it is going to fail. Uh, think of that as like the door hinge on an automobile. It shouldn't fail from one door opening and closing, but maybe after 100,000 times, it will wear out. Lastly, we can also have a gradual decline in properties uh, until they reach some unacceptable level, which you know may be uh, a color and appearance issue, which just may be undesirable, or it may be a structural or mechanical or electrical issue, which actually then can be considered an outright failure. 
but it simply doesn't work 100% one minute and 0% the next, it actually suffers a decline in properties. We can examine something like a photovoltaic solar panel uh, as being like this. When it's brand new, it may produce uh, 250 watts of electrical power, but after a period of, of 10 to 20 years, it may decline at the rate of 1% per year until it reaches some relatively unacceptable uh, industry standard of performance over a period of time. So it's a gradual decline. When we're talking about reliability measurements, we typically are measuring and calculating things such as failure rates, uh, the number of cumulative failures, time until or between failures, uh, and using this information to estimate product lifetimes uh, or, or warranty costs. And the, the techniques are primarily drawn from probability and statistics and the theory of stochastic processes. That last statement simply means whether or not previous events influence future events or not. That's uh, stochastic processes. However, uh, because we are using statistics and probability theory, we need to have large sample populations. So typically, true reliability measurements can only be made on large numbers of a sample population. So if I'm manufacturing nuts and bolts, uh, and I'm making them, you know, by the millions every week, I can test you know thousands of thousands of bolts on a tensile tester to find out if they're all you know what the range of mechanical uh, integrity is. If I'm making automobiles because they're much more expensive than testing a bolt, I may not necessarily be able to test every single car, but certainly I can pull representative samples you know off an assembly line uh, and test it for durability and reliability issues, for example. So typically. Though in uh, product design and development, we typically don't have large statistical sample populations. We're typically dealing in product development or materials formulation chemistry uh, with maybe just a relatively few number of different formulations, maybe with different levels of additives or different processing conditions. Or in the case of a, a manufactured product, we may only be dealing with a handful of prototypes available to see how they perform. So typically, we get a lot of information about durability, but we don't get true information about reliability, which typically requires uh, large numbers of finalized product. However, another difference in durability is that we are typically measuring not only minor properties and major properties such as the you know, loss of performance, but we're also trying to determine and measure things such as the rate of property change with a given amount of time or particular stress or stress level uh, or how long it, the product changes. So we're more interested in actually the routes to failure and then identifying you know, some of the cause, causes and effects uh, and then trying to remedy and improve those. So the, the concept of durability is we're focusing more on not just simply when the event occurs or how often it occurs but actually the rate at which it occurs, what factors influence that rate, uh, and how I can help make the product you know, more durable. Okay? So that's a fundamental difference a little bit between some of the concepts of durability and true reliability. This does allow us, however, to test you know, small representative test specimens. So maybe instead of testing the entire product, I'm only testing uh, relatively small scale laboratory samples. So instead of painting an entire bridge, I could with different coatings, I can simply paint small little test panels of, of, of a few square centimeters, uh, for example, and test those in the laboratory. And typically because we're using very small sample numbers, uh, statistical methods really don't apply. So if I'm testing, you know, 10 samples and or even, you know, three samples and, and one fails, well, that is a very, very significant event. So we focus more on the failures understanding how and why they failed rather than on the number of products that actually you know, passed to survive the test. So when we're talking about environmental durability or weather durability, simply called weatherability, this is really a more specialized discipline within the overall durability concepts that really primarily confines itself to understanding how the, the stresses of the given service environment, whether that's out of doors, anywhere in the world, uh, the interior of an automobile, such as we see on the right-hand side, uh, whatever that service environment is, uh, 
uh, and, and how it affects the degradation of, of a particular product. So we're looking at the effects of the stresses of the service environments, weatherability. Uh, and, and typically this could be anywhere, including outer space. Uh, however, when we're talking specifically about the term weathering, we're really talking about terrestrial surface of the earth applications. Okay. And again, one of the simplest ways to, to do that would simply be to, to test these products you know, out of doors in many different environments. And that is, is done. For example, here at our South Florida test site location shown on the right-hand side of the, of the photographs, uh, we have several million test samples on exposure at any given time, just to give you an idea of the size and scope of weather durability testing. Now, I, I'm often asked by many people where they can study weatherability, durability testing. And the answer is, good luck. You probably won't find any formalized uh, institutional university courses dealing with this topic for several different reasons. Uh, one, it is a multidisciplinary science, whereas you know most university courses tend to focus on specific topics. Also, the length of time that much of this testing really requires, for example, a, a photovoltaic solar panel may be expected to last under uh, its warranty terms for 25 years. So clearly no one is going to invest their entire graduate uh, studies you know, on a 25-year testing program. So as a result of that, you typically don't find a lot of uh, information about weatherability, durability testing as a whole, although you may study specific aspects of it, such as you know, polymer photodegradation or thermal oxidative uh, failure or corrosion, etc. Now, there are a number of things that can be learned and different reasons for doing weather durability testing. And I'm going to show you just a list of a few of these and just touch on a few of the, the, the key points here. Uh, first of all, we can screen or select or characterize different candidate materials and formulations. So I may have several different polymer formulations with different levels of antioxidants and UV inhibitors, stabilizers, and I need to find out which ones work the best uh, or if there are any uh, interaction effects, etc. Uh, secondly, we can understand the factors that result in the degradation or property loss. So I can determine whether or not my product is moisture sensitive, such as a, a coating. If it's moisture insensitive, but does degrade from the effects of ultraviolet solar radiation, uh, etc. So we're trying to identify and understand the significance of what factors cause the product to degrade uh, and then potentially to fail. Uh, identify stabilization requirements. If I know the mechanism how a product fail or material fails, I can then identify certain routes to protecting it, such as with different additives or surface coatings or other protective layers. Determine process variables durability. If I change a process variable such as uh, the extrusion header temperature, you know, a, a polymer on an extruder, does that introduce any chemical or physical defects? For example, if I uh, extrude polyvinyl chloride for a building product for a window uh, extrusion profile and I increase the header temperature to, uh, to be able to increase the line speed to get more product out, out in a given time period, is that going to start to thermally degrade the product and make it turn yellow and brown uh, or potentially cause it to lose mechanical properties from the result of chemicals degradation that is set up by over temperaturing the product. Uh, we can also identify whether or not we can lower cost through material or process changes. Can I switch uh, one of the additives to a different brand at a lower cost without affecting durability? Uh, identify specific degradation failure mechanisms. Characterize performance. You know, how will mechanical uh, tensile strength uh, hold up after 15 years of outdoor weathering, for example. Uh, identify various different climate effects, do competitive analysis. Is my formula or my product better than my competitors or my previous formulations? And then lastly, the holy grail, which is oftentimes a, a very difficult task, is to try to estimate product lifetime through service life prediction methodologies based on short-term tasks. We'll just touch on that topic. That's a multi-week concept uh, by itself. When we're talking about you know, the durability, as I said, you know, we can have the durability of various different components or materials in a product you know, uh, can't interact with each other, and they can also 
affect the overall reliability. And this can occur at many different levels, at the material level, a part or component level, which then brings in manufacturing process conditions as opposed to strictly material chemistry, uh, sub-assembly issues, having to do with how the part is processed or assembled, if there are sharp molded corners, is that a stress concentration point that may cause it to fail at those points. And then when we get up to the system, we have material and part interactions and physical contact. So do plasticizers migrate? Uh, are there other chemical or physical effects uh, inherent in a system that don't show up in the individual materials or components? Okay. Uh, so again, in basic concepts, when we're talking about reliability methodology, we're more often than not looking at uh, the absolute point where a product is acceptable or unacceptable. So we're primarily looking at pass-fail. Works doesn't work. Whereas in durability, we're more focusing on how properties that are important uh, decline or change with conditions of stress, use, or time. That's a very, very broad definition, and some of you may take exception to it, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, it serves us reasonably well. Now, in reliability analysis, there is a fundamental basic concept, which is called the bathtub reliability curve. And it's called that because, in profile, this curve looks like the shape of a bathtub. And what it basically says is that over the lifetime of a product, which is the horizontal axis, if we look at the total number of failures, or the failure rate, more importantly, uh, very often we start off with a lot of uh, a relatively high number of failures of a product, which we call uh, out-of-box failures in the electronics industry or consumer goods industry, uh, or infant mortality is, is really a better term used in the reliability field. And basically it says that very often there are a lot of, uh, there's a higher level of failures very, very early in a product's lifetime that are relatively unexpected uh, and very often not caused by fundamental defects in materials, formulation, processing, or design, but rather due to some extraordinary event. Uh, you know, a process vari variable went out of control, uh, somebody left out an important ingredient, something unusual happened in storage or shipping or manufacturing, you know, etc. Then we enter the uh, design phase of a product where its performance properties and the number of failures are expected to be, you know, at a fairly low uh, typically, you know, relatively constant level over the duration, the lifetime of its product. Uh, and then once we reach this eventual, you know, wear out period, uh, then we reach this end of life and we have a number of increasing failures. We may have a residential hot water heater for your home. Uh, we may have some early infant mortality failures if there were some manufacturing issues or installation issues even. Then during its expected you know, five or ten or, or longer lifetime, it should well, perform relatively worry-free and with very, very few failures until eventually it just be, the heaters become you know, worn out, uh, becomes corroded on the inside, and then we have an increasing number of failures etc. So this is the bath of reliability curve. If we look at it in terms of durability analysis, we really have three distinct different areas that we need to focus on. Uh, and it's important to understand that very often to test for these different aspects, such as infant mortality, uh, the normal operational wear out, and then the uh, determining the end of the life aspect, very often require different types of durability tests. Uh, an example of this would be photovoltaic solar panels. There's a set of initial qualification requirements established by the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEC, uh, which basically puts solar panels through a couple different tests such as uh, thermal cycling test, hail impact tests, humidity freeze tests, a uh, number of environmental chamber tests, uh, to look for things such as bad solder joints and interconnects between the individual photovoltaic cells, corrosion of the uh, metal connectors, failure of the back sheet, et cetera, et cetera. And these typical types of tests require a different testing methodology 
because very often these tend to be defects that are going to be re revealed fairly quickly. So after maybe even 10 thermal cycle tests, if there are some solder bond issues, those will typically be revealed very, very quickly uh, in these accelerated life tests. When we deal with the gradual wear out, which is you know the next you know, from from six months for the next 25 years, sitting on a rooftop or you know out in a utility scale development out in the desert, here we have something totally different. We don't have major temperature excursions. Uh, we have rather a very very high number of high frequency events, uh, but over a, a very very more limited range. Plus, we have a number of interaction effects. We have uh, many different factors that can affect the product, such as we have a daily thermal cycle every 24 hours, not to mention when a cloud passes overhead. We have different thermal cycles. We have seasonality, spring, summer, fall, and winter. As materials start to degrade or mechanical action starts taking its toll, the cyclic fatigue starts setting in. So we have very, very different thermal, chemical, and mechanical actions, and very often we need to have different kinds of tests uh, to catch these. So that's an important concept, that the types of tests we oftentimes use for infant mortality tell us nothing about long-term durability. We're looking to test basically two or more different fundamental properties or concepts with these two different types of testing. And then uh, combining both of these kinds of information can tell us something perhaps about if the tests are conducted properly and they're good tests and correlate to field performance, they can tell us through shorter term testing, something about this uh, end of life period. Now, from an engineering standpoint, and I deal a lot with reliability engineers, especially in uh, the electronics industry, uh, including solar energy products like photovoltaic panels, um, you, you typically have your formulation or your product which has a set of target design specifications uh, regarding you know the strength of, of of the product, electrical performance, mechanical properties, whatever is important. Okay, and these are hard and fast specifications. But in reality, all products as manufactured, based on variabilities of natural ingredients, variabilities in your supply chain, uh, the use of different products from different vendors, if they're unable to, single vendor is unable to supply your product, variables in your process, uh, differences in, in the manufacturing uh, transport storage of a product before its use, you end up with an actual range or distribution of product performances where you have your target specification here in the center. Some of your product as manufactured is actually above those target specifications, but conversely some part of the product uh, is also below its target specifications, uh, although it is still within your tolerance range. So well-manufactured, well-designed products with you know, good materials uh, typically have a very, very narrow distribution. You know, sometimes other products have a wider, broader distribution. The same is also true for the environmental stresses that this design product is going to experience in its service life. And this service life is not only you know, out in the field, in the customer's hands, the end user, but also through you know, the manufacturing, installation, transport, storage, you know, et cetera. And there we typically will choose you know, the target environments. You know, we know, for example, where building products are going to be used. Uh, differences, we know the temperature ranges and solar radiation in northern Europe versus southern China versus the west coast of the United States. And so we can arrive at specific target environmental specifications. However, weather is a variable, uh, as is climate, and some years may be more stressful or deliver higher levels of stress than anticipated, or products are used in locations not originally expected or tested for. And conversely, some product is used you know, in less severe applications or locations. So I just want to point out that even though we have our target design strength and we have our target service environment, there is an intersection here where even very well-designed products that are well-manufactured as well can have failures when they are subjected to service or use stresses or environmental stresses that are at the higher levels of what was expected. And this is particularly troubling because this area is typically not anticipated in terms of failures. Uh, it's not accounted for you know, in terms of warranty set-asides. And failures here typically go right to the bottom line uh, for, in terms of warranty costs. 
plus, they are very, very difficult then to analyze and to change the product design or manufacturing uh, to help prevent those products. There's a fundamental rule of 10 that if you catch a materials or design durability reliability issue, you know, during the design standpoint, uh, it, it say will cost, you know, one dollar. If you don't catch that until, you know, the, the prototype phase where you're actually starting to tool up, that same failure caught at that point will cost you ten dollars. If you don't catch that failure until the product starts going into manufacturing, it's now going to cost you a hundred dollars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And eventually, you get to the point where you, you've gone through your reliability, your preliminary testing, and there may cost you a thousand, you know, dollars uh, to catch a uh, failure. And then by the time it gets to the field, and you send find out that you've got a field failure after five years, that may cost you $100,000. So each different step increases typically by a factor of 10 fold in terms of when you catch these, these warranty costs. So I'm, I'm often asked by uh, reliability engineers who often have a hard time in their companies trying to convey the importance and the need for spending money very early to catch durability and reliability failures in their product, because management doesn't want to spend the money. And if you use you know, this rule of 10, and I've got a very nice slide graphic to illustrate that, if you email me, I'll be glad to provide you with that. It really helps illustrate some, one of the, the economic financial implications you know, to management about the costs of catching failures or durability issues too late. So one of the things that we can do in durability analysis is to try to understand the possibilities of, of this uh, intersection here and then either work to improve or narrow the distribution of the product uh, or otherwise increase the, the specifications for the product in terms of design. Now people oftentimes also ask me, well, where do I begin when trying to understand weatherability, durability uh, issues? Uh, and then get into failure analysis. Well, from an engineering standpoint, there is a, a classic technique called the, the FMEA, or the Failure Mode and Effects Analysis. And this is a fairly formalized process. There's also one that's called an FMECA, which adds a criticality component uh, to this. And this also typically requires uh, some statistical idea as to what types of failure will occur or do occur, but it also requires some out-of-the-box thinking about what possible factors you know, can affect this product. So there are different levels of, design, of FMEAs. There's a design FMEA, a manufacturing FMEA, uh, etc. And so what we typically do is that when we are called in by a customer to uh, try to design a weather durability testing program for product development in particular, we start with the FMEA concepts. Now, in a true FMEA, you have some data to support the likelihood of a failure, whether or not it will occur, uh, the odds of your being able to detect it, and usually we don't have that information available in the beginning. So, But we can use the overall process to help identify not only individual material issues, such as we know that a particular polymer may have a UV sensitivity, for example. But we can also then use that information to identify, all right, if we know that it has a UV sensitivity, how can we design a test to determine how sensitive it is, and then also factor in uh, what is the service environment it is going to see, how much UV solar radiation, for example, will it see in different parts of the world, and estimate a worst case scenario for a lifetime and then come up with various different laboratory tests to validate you know whether or not that is a concern or how the product is going to fail so here we're starting to get into how do we start utilizing laboratory and other tests to design a, a durability reliability assessment program so the beginning steps are typically with the modified failure mode and effects analysis approach as an organized discipline involves uh, weatherability researchers, materials chemists, design engineers, etc. in the company. Now, there are a lot of laboratory testing tools for environmental stresses that we can use. And here's just a very, very simple partial list of a few different types. So we have UV or full spectrum solar simulation. We have temperature cycling by itself. Uh, we have freeze-thaw cycling uh, with or without moisture. 
complete environmental chambers, immersion testing, uh, exposure to atmospheric or, or uh, surface use chemicals, salt fog and corrosion testing, uh, vibration, sand and dust, etc. So there are a wide variety of different tests. The important point to realize here that these fall into one of four categories. Some of these are single stress tests, such as temperature. Others are multiple stress, such as temperature and humidity. Of these, some are steady state tests, such as the 85% relative humidity at 85 degrees C damp heat test called for for solar panels. And others are cyclic or varying tests, such as a thermal cycling test uh, with changes in temperature or changes in temperature and humidity. So at each different level, we isolate different stresses. Uh, when we start getting into multiple stresses and cyclic stresses, then we start also looking at interaction effects. So it's important to understand that if I simply test to single stresses, especially at steady state, which almost never happens in actual field use conditions, that I very often may be able to detect a sensitivity or a failure related to a single stress, such as water immersion or elevated temperature, etc., such as the ice cube melting, but I can't detect interaction effects, such as a coating failure that it may occur only with uh, UV exposure in combination with high levels of moisture. Okay? So at each different types of test, at each different level, I get different amounts of information. So one of the questions then uh, oftentimes asked is, well, why don't you just simply do the most combined possible test to start with and cover all of your bases? Cover as many stresses, deliver it in as many different combinations as possible in your test. And the reason for that is twofold. One, it becomes very expensive to do that. You basically, again, this factor of 10, you increase your, ta your cost of testing you know, approximately tenfold uh, every time you add an additional combined stress or stress level. Uh, and so if you test all different ways, all factors or most conceivable factors, even though some of those could be proven not to have much of an effect or any effect, you've spent a lot of money on testing, uh, have developed a very complicated test. And then, more importantly, if the product does change in properties or performance or fails outright, in a multiple stress test, it becomes very difficult to deconvolute or to go back and identify which specific stress or combination of stresses caused the failure of the product because you have too many experimental variables uh, all going on at the same time. So that is one of the reasons that we typically use a phased approach. Identify uh, which stresses, perhaps through some pre-screening testing, are likely to affect the product. Then determine the likelihood of those. Identify simple tests to try to, to test for those. Uh, and then, based on those results, see if we need to step up to looking at combination or interaction effects, uh, and then also be very important to, to look at interaction or interlayer effects, especially on a manufactured pro product, which may be a composite or a laminate in terms of its construction. Because very often we can have migration of chemical species uh, in, through different layers that would not be caught in testing the individual materials by themselves. Now, there are a lot of different types of qualitative accelerated life tests that go by a lot of different definitions, uh, ALT, HALT, uh, environmental stress screening, uh, HAS, etc. I'm not going to try to differentiate between these. Sometimes the differences are a little bit subtle and, and don't translate very well. The important point is, in terms of most accelerated laboratory testing, is that we are trying to predict changes in property performance of a material or product at normally encountered use stresses over its service lifetime, as shown in the back of this graph. And we are trying to estimate those based on relatively short-term tests, where we very often we are having to employ higher stress levels. Because if we employ the same stress levels, then we just have a very short version of the same test, and it's not going to tell us anything. So it's important to realize that in accelerated testing, we really typically only have two possibilities uh, for uh, 
acceleration. One is what we call time compression, where we simply shorten the test cycle to get, in the case of the cyclic fatigue types of failures, uh, like a door hinge, we can get, uh, instead of opening a car door, you know, twice a day over a period of five years, I can do, you know, maybe 10,000 opening and closing of cycles uh, in, a, in a one week time period, you know, with a robotic arm. So we have time compression and then we have overstress, uh, where we are using higher than normal stress levels to try to estimate the service use stress levels over, delivered over a longer period of time. And typically we need to do that at several different levels because very often there's not a linear relationship uh, between product performance at different stress levels. So ideally what we're trying to do is use these shorter term tests uh, here and here to try to predict the end use service environment durability and reliability. But the reality is that we typically get a range of possibilities. So we then need to refine our tests uh, and try to narrow down this, this, this range. Uh, some of the different things that we can do in terms of how we deliver our stresses, for example, uh, we can deliver our stresses steady state. And again, steady state conditions virtually never happen out of doors. Uh, and oftentimes don't even happen indoors. So very often steady state tests don't always tell us very much or aren't very predictive or correlate well with field performance, such as uh, steady state salt fog corrosion tests are notoriously poor at predicting uh, coating or metal corrosion uh, in the field. Uh, we can have uh, ramping type tests where we increase uh, the ramps of, of the stress levels, uh, either linearly or stepwise, or you know, with some other type of a curve, and this delivers you know not only thermal or mechanical stresses, but can also in some cases you know deliver changes in chemical stresses that are more realistic in terms of the service environment. Uh, here, for example, is uh, one case of a fairly severe large scale uh, solar environmental chamber. This particular photograph on the right-hand side is showing weather durability with solar radiation simulated on a vehicle. Uh, this is in a very, very large test chamber located in Vienna, Austria, that is large enough to actually test railway tram cars. Uh, and here we have an example of a thermal cycling test where the, uh, the blue line here in the center is simply uh, zero degrees Celsius. So above it, we're at elevated temperature and below it, we're freezing. The heavy black line is showing the temperature program into the controls of the environmental chamber. So you'll see it has several different steps and holds at different temperatures. And then the thin line located close to the center of the graph in black is, is the actual product temperature as measured by thermocouples. And you'll see that, of course, it severely lags, in many cases, the actual chamber temperature. So this is a very uh, other important point when we're doing product testing, is that we need to be sure that we understand when doing our calculations and estimating you know, failures and, and the causes of them, that we don't just simply look at what the test chamber conditions were programmed to deliver, we need to understand what is happening to the product sample. So you will see that uh, because the test times here were fairly short, there wasn't sufficient uh, time to allow the product to reach the actual equilibrium temperatures uh, that were, were really required. So there was nowhere near what the product was actually saying in this case. So all accelerated stress tests, not just weathering tests, but all accelerated stress tests, may use conditions that are more severe than will be encountered in the field. However, the use of higher than expected stresses may result in some degradation or failure modes that simply will not occur in the real world. So if you're using short-term elevated stress data to try to extrapolate or predict service lifetimes, you must do some additional testing to validate those assumptions. Also, all of these tests, especially single stress tests, uh, are, are primarily looking at single cause and effect failure mechanisms. In the real world, failure mechanisms are very often a series of combinations 
of multiple stresses or the same stress acting in different effects. For example, changes in temperature have a thermal mechanical effect on a product exposed out of doors. But the changes in temperature also draw, have an effect on moisture and can drive moisture in and out of a product as well. So uh, when we start getting into multiple modes of failure or product change, you need to be careful how you interpret these, these results. Also, they may reveal potential stress sensitivities or failure modes. And it's more difficult to reproduce or accelerate chemistry-based failure mechanisms than it is thermal or mechanical failure mechanisms with accelerated laboratory testing. Okay? Now, we talk about weather durability testing. Uh, what are some of the tools that are available uh, to us? Well, we have outdoor natural testing where we simply place materials or products in the outdoor environment or environments around the world. We also have accelerated outdoor testing, such as concentrating natural sunlight onto the test samples, using additional water sprays to indicate or simulate higher moisture environments, etc. And then we have all of our laboratory uh, environmental chambers and, and benchtop tests as well. Specifically for weatherability testing tools, uh, we have our outdoor tests, which can be you know, fixed position tests in various different climates. Uh, we can have accelerated outdoor tests where uh, if a product is, is primarily to be used in North Central Europe, for example, and we say a coating, and we test that coating on painted metal test panels in Florida or Arizona. Uh, they typically provide about four times the rate of weathering that we see in northern Europe. So in one year of outdoor exposure in Miami, Florida, we can oftentimes get the equivalent of approximately four years uh, of field experience of what a product would see in, say, Germany. There are a lot of caveats to that, so don't take it too seriously. Also, we have accelerated outdoor techniques involving solar tracking, solar concentration, you know, et cetera. Uh, specialized test fixtures. So, for example, for building products, we can actually build test houses in different environments, subject materials to the different temperature extremes of an air-conditioned interior versus the exterior, so we have the same stresses on the inside and the exterior of a product. We can have uh, various types of laboratory accelerated chambers using you know, weatherometers, uh, solar simulation chambers, environmental chambers with or without solar simulation, uh, and other types of tests such as freeze-thaw, salt fog, uh, corrosion tests, gas exposure, water immersion, you know, etc. Now, all of these are tools that are in our toolbox. However, they can be used in various different ways. The most simple and straightforward and understandable approach to weather durability testing uh, is simply an observational or comparative testing. So we have different formulations of our product, or comparing our new product versus our older product or our competitors. We put them all out of doors or even in an environmental chamber or weatherometer at the same time, and we run them to the same duration, and we see how they perform. Uh, and so we get some, some relative data, which is usually more qualitative than it is quantitative. Um, there are a lot of caveats because they only really apply to one set of, of conditions or one location. So saying that you know product A performs better than B and B better than C is usually more reliable than trying to put a finite number and say that A performed 1.7 times better than B and B was only 0.2 times better than C. Next, we can also use ver these various different techniques where we understand the major conditions of the environmental stresses of heat, light, moisture, and their levels at which they need to be delivered. And we do something that's known as forced degradation tests. Uh, this is very often uh, using a fundamental design of, of, of experiment where we understand the uh, low and high levels that we want to stress our product at for the various different stresses such as heat, light, and solar radiation. And we design a set of experiments to test each of them individually uh, as well as in combination to look at interaction effects. So very often we will try to deliberately force a product to fail 
and we can perhaps use the maximum boundary conditions of heat, temperature, uh, moisture, and solar radiation that we would find in different environments to try to understand in a limited number of experiments in the laboratory, does this product fail with high temperature and high moisture, or only in is it only UV solar radiation or visible solar radiation? Uh, and from that, we can eliminate the need for putting samples in lots of different climates out of doors. And then lastly, we can uh, do various different types of service lifetime uh, modeling if we have good mathematical models and understand uh, parameters that requires a lot of data. Typically, we are looking at different parameters such as you know, color and appearance changes, uh, chemical or physical property changes such as tensile or impact strength. Uh, and very often we're looking at a combination of different factors. And each of these very often has a different acceleration factor in the various different tests. So we need to be looking at you know, how each of these changes differently uh, in, in our tests. Uh, an important concept is that the property change during the test very often is not linear with exposure. Very often properties will change in unusual ways. For example, a highly stabilized product against UV solar radiation may have very little change for the first several years of outdoor exposure. Then once the UV uh, inhibitors become used up, uh, has an increasing rate of failure. Uh, so depending upon you know, how the product changes, uh, we need to have some idea of the rate of property change at different exposure points during its product lifetime and able to do true service life prediction. And of course, very often we have multiple properties changing all at different rates. So we need to study each one of them separately, such as gloss, yellowing, delta E, color change, mechanical tensile strength, impact resistance, uh, chemical properties, etc. So the goal in all of our accelerated testing is to have a relatively short-term test which is predictive of real-world long-term performance. Okay? The reality is that all of our tests are going to give us a range of possibilities and we want to try to zero in and narrow that range as much as possible. And that's some of the, the, uh, the art of, of test method test program development. Now, in our lab testing approaches, uh, we can do several different things. We can try to simulate, say, with a weatherometer or an environmental chamber, a specific climate, such as Miami in a box or Germany in a box. Uh, that requires a lot of boxes if we need to have a product to be tested to many different environments. So that's an inefficient and expensive, although simplistic, way of testing. Secondly, we can simply use the worst case boundary conditions of temperature extremes, moisture extremes, and solar radiation extremes and establish a series of limited design of experiment tests uh, where we simply look at the, uh, the, the boundary conditions to determine which are the factors that are most important and then zero in on those for our testing. We can do environmental stress screening. Again, do we really need to worry about UV solar radiation for a particular product or not? If we automatically include it, it will increase the cost of our test. So doing some pre-screening tests can give us a lot of information. And then we can also do forced degradation tests to try to understand just how robust our product is to the extremes of, of various different climate conditions and, and understand product robustness. So very often we employ a test progression so not only do we use different types of tests and different types of tests to predict short-term infant mortality versus longer-term accumulated damage from long-term outdoor exposure, but very often we need to test at various different stages in the product design and, and uh, development. So we may do short-term you know, accelerated tests in the laboratory on small test coupons, such as these uh, colored ABS plastic plaques looking for color change under solar simulation. We can also do short-term outdoor testing on small-scale samples. Once we combine different materials together into a manufactured product, which has now gone out of the laboratory and into process conditions, we can then still do the same thing, depending upon the size of the product, still do laboratory or small-scale outdoor testing. But once we start getting into really large products, where you have lots of material-material interactions, 
uh, especially on a laminate structure such as, as we would have with a photovoltaic solar panel, then we need to do typically you know, either large scale environmental chamber testing, uh, which is very expensive and many people don't have the capabilities, uh, or else we need to do large scale outdoor testing. Okay? Again, it's important to understand we need to test the product failure. Because the property changes is very often not linear, if I simply stop my test at a predetermined point, such as exposure interval time one, and the property changes like this green line, I may say, oh, well, look, it failed, reached this red failure line very quickly. This is not going to be a good product or good formulation. On the other hand, if the product, we run it out to time interval number three out here at the end, we may say, aha, the actual property change leveled out at this point, just beyond our last measurement, and actually had very, very little property change after that. And so it actually may have been a very, very acceptable product, but I stopped my test too soon, and I didn't understand the shape of the degradation curve versus exposure or time. So which one of these is right? Uh, well, we, if we stopped in the beginning here, and the curve looks like this purple colored line, uh, and I stop at time interval number one, I may think I have a very durable product, but the reality is that if I had just run it a little bit longer, it may have fallen off the cliff. So we need to test multiple time points as well as very often multiple stress levels in our testing program. And just one cautionary note that most of the applicable uh, international weathering standards are very inadequate for predicting performance in any particular climate. Uh, none of them really do that. So you must always uh, look at standards, but understand whether or not they are suitable for the intended application and the nature of the product and its specific material chemistry. And also, just because you get a change of property in a test does not prove correlation. In other words, does not prove cause and effect. Uh, different products can yellow from the effects of temperature or UV solar radiation, so cause and effect must be proven. And no single test is going to tell you everything you need to know. You need to do a number of different tests. There are many chemical reasons uh, why products behave in a nonlinear fashion. I'm not going to try to discuss those. Uh, this is a chemistry reason, um, but they have to do with activation energies of the product in relation to the test fundamental of, of properties such as polymer glass transition temperature versus test conditions. The degradation kinetics typically undergoes a classic S-shaped curve, and you need to understand where you are at on that, that curve in terms of predicting long-term performance based on short-term tests. Fundamental changes in the chemistry, I can drive and force a different chemistry to occur by choosing inappropriate conditions of the test. So my little road sign here, uh, we can force a product to take a path it would not normally take uh, just by changing the conditions of the test. So in summary, the general paths to assess durability approach from the materials level up, identify what are the important properties we need to measure, what analytical tools we're going to use, as well as their sensitivity and reproducibility, uh, then start determining our test plan. Typically start with single stress screening to eliminate stresses we don't have to worry about. Identify uh, combinations of stresses and cyclic stresses. That's important to understand the possible interaction effects between stresses and then also study the time dependency or the shape of the degradation curve with stress or time. Be careful about when testing to a finite endpoint. You should really test to failure to be sure that you have a reliable test. And then you can use this data uh, to extrapolate and estimate, but must always validate with real world testing. So in conclusion, you can use the FMEA as a basic starting point. Uh, identify the materials contributions to durability, especially specific chemistries, characterize the end service environments the product is going to be exposed to, determine what properties we need to evaluate and how we're going to do that, because that very often will determine special forms of the sample, number of replicates, especially if they're destructive analytical tests, 
And then lastly, uh, use the data to design for maximum cost-effective durability and reliability by focusing on the weakest links. And with that, I thank you.